All right, get my cheat sheet. Because even though it's a top 10, I don't know by heart, you'd think I would. Okay, let's get started. Welcome back to my channel. I am Brent, and if you haven't subscribed yet, you probably should because I talk about geeky things. And today we're gonna to talk about my top 10 favorite Power Ranger scenes of all time. If you guys have been following me for a while, you guys will know that in 2013, which was when the 20th anniversary special for Power Rangers came out, I decided to get caught up with Power Rangers because I was watching Me Mega Force and I came across a couple of Power Rangers that I just didn't know anything about because I hadn't seen their season. And so I decided that I was going to watch all of them. They're all available on Netflix except for the two movies, I think. I don't know, but I have the two movies on DVD, so it really doesn't matter. Technically one is in Canada, but we're gonna get to that later because I wish it was. But I became a fan of some seasons that I never thought I would become a fan of, but some of them have like my favorite scenes ever in all of Power Rangers. So I thought it'd be fun to sit down and kind of talk about it. And FYI, there will be spoilers in this video. So for whatever reason, if you haven't seen Power Rangers and don't want to get spoiled, it's been a long time. So like, whatever. But Dylan, turn off this video because I don't want to spoil some things for you because just turn off the video Dylan just, I'll see you later leave a comment Dylan and just say hi I love you and I'll say I love you back just don't watch this video but seriously if you guys don't want to be spoiled for something Power Rangers related I will be spoiling a lot of things in Power Rangers so a lot of final scenes a lot of final moments a lot of heartbreaking moments so just turn off this video. So now that all of those guys are gone, all the people that have not gotten caught up with Power Rangers and don't want to be spoiled, I wouldn't have wanted to be spoiled either, but I think a lot of them are spoiled, but whatever. It's not a big deal. Let's get started. Number 10 on my list is the deaths of Lost Galaxy. <laughs> So Lost Galaxy was actually where I lost interest in Power Rangers the first time because it was just such a dark season and I was not ready for a dark season. I was 12, guys. I, I was 12 years old. I remember when the first episode aired, we were actually at Disney World when the first episode of Lost Galaxy aired and I refused to let my family go to Disney World until I got to see the season premiere of Power Rangers Lost Galaxy. So they went for a walk around our uh, resort <laughs> And I sat there for a half an hour watching Power Rangers Lost Galaxy, the premiere of Power Rangers Lost Galaxy, and then we left for the Magic Kingdom. <laughs> it's such a perfect story because I'm such a Power Ranger fan and have been a Power Rangers fan for so long, but also because I'm such a Disney fan and Disney World is like literally my favorite place on earth. So like watching it as an adult, I found my absolute love for Lost Galaxy. As a matter of fact, I'm rewatching RPM right now, but now I'm thinking I might want to rewatch Lost Galaxy because it was such a good season and I love it so much. So I don't know, we'll see. I'm gonna probably finish RPM today, so we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. So by the time you see this, I'm not watching RPM anymore and I probably have already finished rewatching Lost Galaxy. So, but Lost Galaxy came with two huge deaths that you would never have really honestly expected. And that is the death of the Magna Defender and the death of Kendrix. It was the first time we had ever lost a Power Ranger, like to death. We've always lost Power Rangers to loss of power. We've lost Power Rangers to, you know, becoming peace ambassadors in Switzerland, which my family remembers fondly of me calling them peace invaders versus peace ambassadors because I was so young and stupid. Um, but either way, peace ambassadors in Switzerland, you know, gymnastics tournaments, uh, staying in Africa to help the animals, you know, lots of great reasons to lose Power Rangers over the time uh, growing up and choosing new people to take uh, over for you. To lose a Power Ranger to death. That was a lot to handle. Um, I actually remember that because I was, wa I watched all of Lost Galaxy. I just didn't, I just didn't continue on after Lost Galaxy is kind of what happened. And I remember watching that and thinking, they just killed a Power Ranger. Like, what? Of course, I liked who they replaced her with. I mean, because here's the other thing that gets to me when it comes to Kendrix's death. It was the first time a female was my favorite Power Ranger. It was the first time a pink Ranger was my favorite Power Ranger. Not the last, but the, the first. And it's and I've only ever had two favorite pink, ra pink Power Rangers in my time of watching Power Rangers. And uh, if you guys ever want me to go through all of my favorite Power Rangers season by season, let me know in the comments below and I will do that. Um, but at the end of the day, like, Kendrick's was my favorite character in The Lost Galaxy. And I was devastated when she died. And I'm like, of course, the first time I like a girl Power Ranger, the first time I like the pink Ranger, I hate the color pink. The color pink makes me actually, like, actually angry. 
Um, and I don't know why it, it, it evokes this kind of anger in me, but it does. I see the color pink and for some reason I am angry. I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> I really, like even if I were to ever have kids and they were to like the color pink, I'd be like, no, you're not allowed to like the color pink. And anyway. when Kendricks dies is the, uh, kind of Power Ranger meetup with Power Rangers from in space. And then the Power Rangers from Lost Galaxy coming together to defeat the Psycho Rangers, because apparently they were not fully defeated the first time because they were brought back from death and just they were out destroying things again. And Kendrick sacrifices herself to save Cassie and Kendrick's died. <laughs> it just was so weird. And what made it even weirder is when I got older and I looked it up and I realized that the reason why they had to write her off was because she was going in for leukemia treatment. Saban. Saban, if you're watching this, can we have a quick little chat, you and me? Can we have a little chat? What if she had actually died? What if the actress actually died? It's very common for adults to die from leukemia, Saban. But apparently that is when she went in to go uh, and get leukemia treatments. And I'm thinking, what? Like, I look back at that and think, oh, like, that's so awful. Like, as an adult thinking, oh my god, what if she'd actually died? Luckily, the actress survived. She actually came back for the final episode, and it was great. Even though I kind of wish they wouldn't have, because it kind of ruined her death a little bit. The second one from that uh, kind of thing is, of course, the Magna Defender. Um, and this is what made me really interested as an adult to watch Ginga Man, because I really want to see this scene and what this scene really meant. The Magna Defender had a son. The son dies. And, you know, already really dark, but there was really no other way to tell that story through the Sentai. <laughs> so I'm very excited to see Ginga Man. I have not watched Ginga Man. Please don't spoil it for me in the comments below, please. I am in the middle of Car Ranger right now, so if it's Mega Ranger, Ginga Man, anything past Car Ranger, I am not wanting to get spoiled. I have seen anything through, from Jetman all the way through O Ranger at this point, so. Just don't spoil it in the comments below, please. I do not want to get spoiled. But either way, I'm really excited to see how that plays out in Ginga Man. But it was a really cool moment as he's walking like through fire and lava and all this stuff and just being completely and utterly defeated. And then he just goes. And the last thought in his head was his son. And ah, even as an adult, that was such a hard moment to get through. It was such a difficult moment to get through. Like it just was, it was so sad, but I love it. It's such a great season and such a great moment. And those two deaths were so great. And I think that Lost Galaxy is so overshadowed because it was the season right after the Zordon era. And that just seemed to get so overshadowed and I love it so much. And for the way that I'm talking about this, can you imagine how much I'm gonna talk about the other ones on my list? Let's move on. Number nine on my list is when the Thunder Megazord blows up. <laughs> this one is actually more or less because of the emotions that I had when I was a kid. Um, and then watching it now as an adult and going, oh, there, there are those emotions again that I had when I was a kid, cool. When it came to the original Megazord, the one on my shirt, um, that was never truly destroyed. It was, it was unachievable with Zed and would have been destroyed had they used it against Zed, but they essentially just evolved their Zords into the Thunder Zords and the Thunder Megazord. In other words, they stopped using the Jew Ranger footage and started using the Die Ranger footage. This is the first time we ever truly lost a Megazord to like in this fashion. It wouldn't be the last, but it was the first time we lost a Megazord in this fashion. And I was just absolutely devastated when it happened and watching the Power Rangers just be so sad and so distraught and so upset over this. And I really hated Rito at first, but then I found out he was just more like a comic relief and I was super excited about it and I was super there for it. And I love Rito. He's one of my favorite villains in Power Rangers history. So there you go. That's another thing you want me to talk about is my favorite villains of Power Rangers history, whether it's main villains or lackeys, let me know in the comments below and I will do another top 10 video on Power Rangers and my favorite villains, whether you want either one or you just want one video of both because there is probably enough in there for one video of both. Anyway, moving on. Watching that scene as a kid, it was really traumatizing because I was as traumatized as the Power Rangers were essentially because, it, you know, when you're a kid and you are obsessed with Power Rangers, just like everybody else on this on the face of this planet, like I felt this immense, it's like that scene in Star Wars when Alderaan blows up. <laughs> And Obi-Wan is like, it's like a thousand souls screaming in agony. That is kind of how I felt when that happened, which is like a lot, like that's a lot, like I get it, that's a lot. But at the same time, is how I felt. 
And now watching it as an adult, I still kind of cry when it happens because I'm sitting there going, oh my God, like I'm feeling all these feelings that I felt when I was a kid. And while I don't have that same like moment of all the kids in the world crying and being upset at the same time, like it was the first time I watched it because I watched a brand new one, Fox Kids. It was still just one of those moments where I just, I was so very, very sad. And I still get sad when I see that scene because of that. Anyway, moving on. Number eight on my list is the introduction of Dylan, the Black Power Ranger in Power Rangers RPM. And the reason why I like this is actually more of a film criticism kind of view, because obviously I watched RPM as an adult. Even if I had watched it when it first came out, I was still an adult. Um, I really look at looked at RPM in general. Like I'm rewatching RPM right now and just remembering how amazing it actually is as a season. It's so dark. There's so much involved. There, it's so adult in a lot of ways. It's so good. It's so good. But their formula has always been, you know, these good people becoming Power Rangers. And Disney kind of played with that a little bit. You know, I mean, with Mystic Force, they had Nick. He was kind of a nomad. He really didn't have a family. He jumped from family member to family member. He really didn't do anything bad, but he was this kind of quiet new guy in town. You know, you had um, SPD, where your red Power Ranger and your yellow Power Ranger were actually like crooks. And then they become Power Rangers. And one of them decided to go back to his old life. Maybe not as a crook, I guess. I don't remember. I have to rewatch SPD. But but he went back to his old life. Like he had no intention of staying on this police force that were the Power Rangers for SPD. And so you have RPM where all the characters have these kind of darker backstories. And Dylan's backstory is obviously the darkest. Like if you've ever watched RPM, you know that Dylan's is the darkest. But I like how they introduce Dylan because it's usually how they would introduce the Red Power Ranger, especially in Disney seasons, is how they would have introduced their formula for introducing the Red Power Ranger, which was kind of like this new guy is pulling up and you know you've already got these established friends or established teammates or established you know police force whatever it is but then there's this new guy that just kind of pulls up and does his thing and that's usually the red power ranger with nick with jack with so many other power rangers it's just they've already been in this established team i mean even wild force before disney owned it you already had this established team of power rangers and they needed a red ranger and then they introduce this kind of quiet new guy you know and that's how they introduced the red power ranger but that's how they introduced the black power ranger and i thought that that was so cool i thought that was such an interesting take on how to introduce a power ranger and making it clear that the red ranger is not the focus of this particular power ranger season but it's actually the black power ranger that's the focus of the power Rangers. it's so good it's just it's just so good and i love it and i love dylan he's my favorite character in power rangers rpm but either way i'm giving away a whole other video at this point <laughs> Moving on. Number seven on my list is when the command center blows up. So, oh, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, why do you keep blowing things up that I love? So, the command center, beginning of Power Rangers Zeo, it was like they were ending Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, because if you guys don't know the actual story about how they were started with the same suits for three years, but they changed Zords because they were still changing the Sentai, was because Mighty Morphin Power Rangers was its own series. Like, yes, they used three seasons of the Sentai, but it was really just its own thing. So at one point, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers was canceled. Saban decided, because he just could make this decision, to create a spin-off series called Power Rangers Zia. So what they had decided to do was kind of restart. So they decided to restart with new sets, new everything, and just follow the Sentai year by year, just like the Sentai does, new suits, new powers, new characters, everything. Even though they kept the same characters still for, you know, throughout the Zordon era, they just kind of slowly switched people out, minus Turbo, but that's a whole other story. I might do a rant out of love about Turbo, because there are so many things about Turbo I can't stand. Turbo was executed very, very poorly. Anyway, moving on. They decided to blow up the command center, and as a kid, again, just like I talked about with the Thunder Megazord, as a kid, this was incredibly traumatizing, because they're in the command, they're in the command center, and all of a sudden, Rito and Goldar appear, and they steal the Zeo crystal, and then they zoom off, they, they go ahead and teleport out of the command center, and then all of a sudden, it's everything starts to explode. And the Rangers are freaking out. They're trying to get Zordon Alpha out of there somehow. They're tr they know they can get Alpha out, but they need to get Zordon out. They need to figure it out. They don't have a lot of time. Zordon is telling them, you need to go. You need to get out of here. And they're like, we're not leaving without you. And then all of a sudden, you know, he tells Alpha to teleport the Rangers out. He teleports the Rangers out. The Rangers stand up and see the command center explode. This has been etched into my brain for years. 
how long has it been since that season? More than 20. And it has been etched into my soul because I thought Zordon was dead. Granted, he wasn't. We're getting there. We're, we're getting to Zordon's death. Spoiler alert for my own video. But I thought Zordon was dead and I thought Alpha was dead. And I was thinking, what the heck is gonna happen now? But of course he wasn't. And this kind of goes hand in hand with when they see the power chamber for the first time and get their Zeo powers and they turn around to see their old suits behind them as Zordon says that this is a new era, a new step in the Power Ranger world. And I was thinking, yeah, it really is. It really is a new moment in Power Rangers history. And this was the end of an era. We had spent the last three years with those suits. We had spent the last three years with that command center. And now we have new suits and the power chamber instead of the command center. We still have Zordon Alpha, but it was all new. And while I fell in love with the power chamber and I fell in love with Zeo and Power Ranger Seasons after, that scene still makes me cry because it really is still the end of an era. Number six on my list is when Nick becomes Korag. So in order to explain why this is my favorite scene in all of Power Rangers or one of my favorite scenes in all of Power Rangers, is you, I have to ex kind of explain Mystic Force. And I, I know for some of you, you guys are like, I know Mystic Force, we've seen Mystic Force, but leave, leave it alone. But for those of you who are not super familiar with Mystic Force, or maybe you might not understand why this is such an important scene for me and looking at it as a film critic, why it's such an important scene in character development for Nick. So as you guys know, if you guys have seen Mystic Force, if you guys are familiar with Mystic Force, you guys would know that of course, Lee and Bo is Korag and Nick is Lee and Bo's son, which he doesn't know any of these things. We don't know that Lee and Bo is Korag at first. We don't know Nick is Bowen. We're sitting there uh, watching the Power Rangers defeating Korag time and time again. He's kind of the Goldar, the Ecliptor, or whatever, you know, insert main lackey right here. So then we find out that Korag is in fact Lee and Bo, which doesn't change Nick's feelings about Korag because he's now struggling with trying to become Lee and Bo again, but also struggling with the fact that Korag is kind of this other personality inside of him now, and there's no real escape from him just yet. There's that weird little battle. It doesn't take very long because this is all very, very quick, and it could have been better if they would have elongated the series a little bit and given a little bit more time to this moment, but it's fine. I'm not gonna complain too much about it. It's a kid's show. Like you can't really complain too much about a kid's show and about, you know, execution as well, you know, when, it, when it's a dark story like that. So then of course we do find out that Nick is in fact Bowen, which of course is what sets Lee and Bo free from Korag completely. But Nick still has this kind of thing in between him and Lee and Bo, even after Lee and Bo sacrifices himself to s make sure the master can't become freed yet. Of course he comes back, so it's not like he's, a, it's like not like a true sacrifice, but either way, he's gone for a while again and they think he's dead. And even Nick is like, I don't care. He, you know, he may have been my father, but like, I'm not emotionally connected to him. He just spent, you know, the last however many months trying to defeat us, trying to destroy us. Like, no, he's, he may be biologically my father, but he's not emotionally my father. And then of course, when he comes back, there's still this like kind of distance between the two of them. And Nick just cannot accept the fact that his father is in fact Liambo, or at least accept that he should have, should have this emotional connection. And let me preface this with saying that if you are in a toxic relationship with a family member, understand that you should never stay in a toxic relationship, even if it is with a family member. Like this is not me romanticizing that kind of relationship, I promise. This is just me saying, you know, how I feel about this particular season or this particular moment. So of course, then Nick gets possessed by the master and he then becomes Korag and starts defeating all of these people in this village and then starts to fight Lee and Bo. Once Lee and Bo is able to free him from Korag completely and free him from the master, it's this moment that Nick realizes what his father went through and understood then that his father really did love him and his father wasn't doing all of those things. Yes, it was his father inside of Korag, but it wasn't his father, it was Korag. And that he, this power was just so much more powerful than he could have ever imagined. And I think that that's just a great moment in Power Rangers history and I love it. Number five on my list is when Maddie takes control in the final episode, Power Rangers Mystic Force. So kind of going along with the one from before, because they're both from the last story from Mystic Force, the last episode, even though it's two-parter. I consider it all one episode, even if it's a two-parter, because it's the same story, just haven't been told in two episodes. Anyway, so in the final episode of Mystic Force, we have the Mystic Force facing off against the Master in a different dimension, and they're losing. They're getting their asses handed to them. They escape into this little cave, where Nick finally proclaims that he's just done, that he can't do this anymore, that this is just too hard. 
and the others are yelling at him so this is it this is just you're you're done you're gonna run away the great nick you know this child of the greatest warrior and the greatest sorceress of all time put together into bowen and you're done like you're just gonna give up and he says yes <laughs> i'm giving up and maddie who is usually this very reserved character she was never really one even though i love her because i love the color blue and i love the fact that blue rangers can be girls too I'm waiting for the first ever pink ranger guy, though. If there is one in the Sentai that I have not seen, let me know if there is a pink guy ranger in the Sentai. Because I'm waiting for that in Power Rangers. It'd be great. Even though I hate the color pink. I like whenever there's a season without the color pink. But she was always very reserved. Like, she never really expressed too much about how she felt. She kind of hid behind her camera. I relate to Maddie in a lot of ways, though I'm not super reserved. But I do like to hide behind a camera. I do like to hide that way um kind of thing and I, I don't know maddie and i were, were kindred spirits in a lot of ways we both have the color blue in our hearts but for the first time she decided to stand up and she let nick have it um she was like no you are the leader you are going to get us out of here we are going to survive we're going to save the world basically and she just she let him have it and i love that scene i just really really do i really love when characters that are kind of step, when, when you have a character development and you step out of what your character was really known for, but in a way that doesn't throw me out of the show or the movie or whatever, but there's this moment where the character kind of just kind of comes out of their shell and does something that they don't, they wouldn't normally have done at the beginning of the show. It kind of indicates, you know, the whole idea that your character goes from point A to point Z and that they could never go back to point A ever again. That you have to change your character's storytelling in a way that you can never bring your characters back to the place that they once were before. That they were at the beginning of the story. You can't bring them back to that moment. That's the that's the quintessential like good storytelling, especially in movies, technique, where you have your character go from point A to point Z and they can never go back to point A. And that is Maddie to a T. And I mean all of the characters in general, but Maddie specifically, because again, she was so reserved at the beginning and becoming a Power Ranger brought her to life, essentially. And I just thought that that was such a cool moment. And I think that Maddie is one of my favorite characters. So I love it. I really love it. And she's just really cool. And that's one of my favorite scenes. Number four on my list is the basketball scene from Jungle Fury. And some of you may not even know what I'm talking about, even if you've seen Jungle Fury, but it stuck with me. I think mostly because I was working retail management when I saw it. And I realized that this was the perfect way to describe management and leadership ever. And it really made me rethink actually Dino Thunder of all things, because Dino Thunder, the formula of Dino Thunder and the formula of Jungle Fury were very, very similar. We have three Rangers to start, their mentor becomes a Power Ranger, throughout the course of the series and then of course they battle all together so those two have very very similar formula so maybe actually kind of rethink how dino thunder was executed as a series because i think that that was something that was severely missed i think with connor's character it would have worked really really well for that same kind of feeling but either way so if you guys are not familiar with what i'm talking about with jungle fury casey is the red power ranger he becomes the red power ranger he's the leader of the power rangers and then their mentor rj becomes the purple power ranger throughout the course of the series and then he starts to casey starts to have have issues with the idea that RJ is the leader now even though he's not Casey is still the leader Casey is still the po Red Power Ranger but RJ is calling all these meetings and calling all these trainings and calling all these shots and things like that and Casey's really starting to struggle with this concept that RJ was once their mentor and is now a Power Ranger and that's honestly a lot for him to deal with and he's starting to feel like he's less important in the team while he should be the leader he's becoming less and less important as time goes on. So he finally kind of has it out with RJ in a way. What I love from that scene is when RJ grabs this basketball, looks at this hoop, and he's in a position where he could never make the shot. And he looks at the basketball and he, or the hoop and he says, if I don't make this shot, Casey, Daishi wins. If I don't make it, Daishi wins. And Casey goes from here, you're you're crazy. You're nuts. That's not gonna happen. You're not gonna you're not gonna get the ball into the hoop. And he goes, it doesn't matter. If I don't make this shot, Daishi wins. Like, there is no, well, it's too far, well, it's too hard, well, it's too, you know, anything. If I don't make this shot, Daishi wins. All right, fine, have at it. Throw the ball. Casey's thinking he's crazy. And I mean, RJ's a little eccentric, let's get it real. So RJ throws the basketball, and Casey realizes it's not gonna hit. And Casey runs, grabs the ball, and dunks it himself. And RJ goes, see, there you go. And he goes, what, I, I'm the one that made the shot. And he goes, right, but you did what all leaders, what all good leaders need to be doing, making sure the team succeeds. Management, 
in a nutshell. As a matter of fact, I've always thought about the idea that if I were to ever be in a position where I could hire um, people ever again, I never really did because obviously I had to follow very strict guidelines when I was working retail management because I always worked for corporations. But if I were to ever be in a position where I could make the rules and I could train managers how I would want to train them, I would show them that scene. Like I don't care if they think I'm crazy for liking Power Rangers in my 30s. I would love to show them that scene because that is what management is. That is what leadership is. When I was a retail manager and something went wrong, I took full responsibility for the failure. And then that meant that I needed to retrain my team to make sure that it didn't happen again. But at the end of the day, it was my fault. If there was a success in my store or in my department, I took the step back and said, well done team, you guys rock. At the end of the day, that's how management works. Things go wrong, it's the manager's fault. Things go right, hooray to the team, the manager takes a step back. The manager makes sure, the leader makes sure that the team is up lifted, that the team succeeds. Whether they are calling the shots or not doesn't matter. Whether they are the leader, when it comes to that moment, it doesn't matter. It's a team effort at the end of the day. And yes, there is the one person that's in charge of training. There's this one person that's in charge of making sure that everything goes right. But at the end of the day, it is about making sure that the team succeeds. And that was told in the Power Ranger season. <laughs> and yet retail managers miss it all the time. And so that I think, like I said, is such a great scene. And hey, if any corporate people are watching this video at all, check it out because it is one of the best scenes and you should be training all of your managers like that. It's a great, it's so incredible. So incredible. Number three on my list is when Jen and Wes have to say goodbye to each other in Power Rangers Time Force. Power Rangers Time Force was one of the ones that I would watch every once in a while. Um, I never really watched Lightspeed Rescue when I got out of Power Rangers when I was a kid, but when Time Force came on, I kind of was interested in the way that the story was told. I really liked Circuit. Um, my friend Nikki, who you guys saw in my mukbang, she was still watching Power Rangers at that point. She really liked Trip, the Green Ranger, because he had green hair. But And I really liked Eric, you know, even when I was kind of in and out of that season a lot. I just didn't watch it from beginning to end until I was an adult. And I'm really glad because I think a lot of it would have been lost on me, especially the Jen and Wes storyline, which of course, Jen is from the year 3000. Wes is from the year 2000 or 2001, something like that. And they slowly fall in love throughout the course of the series. And then they have to say goodbye at the end because they can't be together because time separates them and it's impossible for them to be together. It is not like Inuyasha and Kagome. You know, Jen can't go back and spend the rest of her life in the past. Why? I don't know. I don't know because they needed to tear, Saban needed to tear our hearts out. That's why. But the fact that he, you know, he was saying goodbye to all of his other friends, all the other Power Rangers except for Eric, because obviously Eric was from the, pr the present as well. And they all leave, go back to the ship, and then Jen turns back around and runs back to Wes to tell him that she loves him. It's a lot, you guys, that's all. That's all I got for that one. It's just so beautiful. It's just a beautiful moment. It's just a beautiful moment. The last two both involve Zordon and the death of Zordon. Can you guess what they are? Can you? Can you guess? Can you guess? One of them's not canon, technically. So number two on my list is from the first Power Ranger movie, which of course is not technically canon, though I wish it was, because I think that the story of going to Phaedos and meeting Delcia and getting the powers that way was much better, and they could have just told Cocker Ranger in the correct order instead of backwards, and everything would have been great because Ninjor could have come in later, and it would have been fine. Like, everything would have been okay. They could have made it canon. They could have. But of course, if you guys are not familiar with the first movie, the Rangers, um, is Ivan Ooze, destroys the command center, destroys Zordon's uh, time warp tube, and the rangers have to go to Phaedos to get new powers in order to save the world, and of course, Zordon. And when they get back with their new powers, they find out that it's too late and Zordon is already gone. And they're sitting there crying and being heartbroken, and I remember being heartbroken in the theater. And then Tommy reminds them that with those who possess their great power, all things are possible, so they all surround the time warp, and with magic, with the magic of the Ninjetti, they were able to bring Zordon back from death. Ha! <sighs> I remember being a kid in the movie theater watching that and just being so sad and then so happy all at the same time. It is still my favorite moment in that movie and I love it. So good, you guys. It's just, it's such a great moment. Out 
Mr. Bothrow? I'm a frog. <laughs> yes, a frog. Like the one you kiss. Get a handsome prince. Yes, he finally believes. <laughs> I'm okay. The new Gold Ranger's right here. And number one on my list is when Zordon actually dies. <laughs> For good this time. Uh, which again, obviously, the first Orange movie is not technically canon, so he only dies the one time in Power Ranger canon. But I don't care, Zordon still died twice in my life. So with Power Rangers in Space, if you guys are not familiar with Power Rangers in Space, the Rangers find out that Zordon's been kidnapped and so they go off into space to save him where they meet Andros. And then of course they, they end up having to defend Earth from Astronema and still at the same time, still trying to find Zordon. And they finally do find Zordon on Astronomous ship or Andros does find Zordon on Astronomous ship. And then Zordon informs him that the only way to save the galaxy is to kill him sacrificing Zordon, save the galaxy. And of course, Andros is like, no, like I'm not gonna kill you. I'm not going to do that. I can't, you are, you're Zordon. And I'm thinking as a 12 year old kid, no, you can't, you're Zordon. Of course, at the end of it all, Andros of course does kill Zordon. This light <laughs> radiates from Astronomous ship and purifies all the evil in the galaxy, whether it turns the evil into dust or it turns them into good versions of themselves and thus ends the Zordon era of Power Rangers. <laughs> Ugh! It's a lot, it's, it's a lot <laughs> for me to handle. There are a couple things that I would have probably changed from Power Rangers in Space, mostly uh, involving that, where I think that the original Power Rangers should have been involved with this final fight, as well as I think that they should have expressed the sadness of Zordon's death, but again, it's a kid's show, so like we couldn't get too deep at that point in time. Apparently it was fine the final, the next season to kill off a bunch of Power Rangers or kill off characters and then be fine with it and showing how emotional death can be. But the season before, no, that doesn't work. <laughs> but it was just, as a kid, it was just so heartbreaking. Because I remember I actually wrote in my diary, so I had this Power Rangers diary. And I mean, it was so silly for me to have a locked diary because there was no reason for me to have a locked diary. I didn't do anything to require a locked diary. But either way, at one point I'd like to find it and read you guys some of my entries. But I remember just being so, I read it one time. I was so distraught over the fact that this was the end of Power Rangers. It, it was supposed to be, but it ended up not being the end of Power Rangers. And we we're still watching Power Rangers to this day. So there you guys have it, my top 10 favorite Power Ranger scenes. If there are any that I miss that you guys love, let me know in the comments below and maybe I'll change my top 10 because I may have forgotten about a few of them because there's a few that I haven't seen for many years now. So let me know in the comments below what your favorite Power Ranger scenes are and I will see you guys all next week. Bye.